Hello. On the occasion of the fourth international uh, Islamic bioethics conference to take place as a part of the annual Congress on Medical Law of the World Association for Medical Law, uh, all of this happens in Coimbra, Portugal on August 2015, we would like to have a short uh, discussion on the field of Islamic bioethics and what is to be expected. So I welcome here uh, Professor Vardit Rispler Chaim, uh, Professor of uh, Islam and Arabic literature, uh, a renowned scholar in the field of Islamic bioethics, Islamic medical ethics, author of several books, including Islamic medical ethics in the 20th century, uh, disability in Islamic law, and a series of articles in this field. And I welcome you here uh, today, uh, Vadit. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And as uh, co-chair of the uh, Islamic uh, Bioethics uh, Conference and a member of the International Scientific Committee, I wondered if you could perhaps share with us a little bit about uh, this field of uh, Islamic uh, uh, bioethics. So, uh, first of all, I wanted to ask you, is there really relevance? What is the importance of religious bioethics nowadays? Okay, uh, the debate whether ethics are secular <laughs> or have any touch upon religion, I try, uh, I tend to identify with those who think that religion does have an impact on uh, medical ethics, on bio biomedical uh, or bioethical uh, ethics. Um, and uh, the field of Islamic bioethics, since it uh, represents uh, uh, more than a billion and a half uh, people in the world, I think it has a place. And uh, uh, the, the field itself started about 10 years after Childress and the Buchem uh, uh, formulated their principle of medical ethics which was not religious. Renowned scholars from, uh, from uh, Kennedy uh, Institute of Ethics in Georgetown. Right, those who, who formulated the principles of, uh, of bioethics mm -hmm. and they are like the founders of medical ethics, the modern field of bioethics. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, uh, it felt that something was uh, missing in the sense that people who abide by a certain religion don't always find, find all the solutions in the principles of uh, um, of Childress and Biochem. And there is a need for some additions, some alterations, according to the various religions. Mm -hmm. So we do have Jewish medical ethics, Buddhist medical ethics, Christian medical ethics of the various de denominations. And of course, the need was also for Islamic so medical ethics. Is it more uh, philosophical discussion and academic uh, discussion or a theological discussion or are there elements that are practical or related to everyday life? So it is both, I would say. First of all, it is an academic field where scholars of uh, not necessarily Muslims, Muslims and others, study Muslim, Muslim texts that discuss medical ethics to see how they derive into conclusions, what are the points that they dwell on, where, where would a Muslim patient find difficulty uh, with the Western medical ethics, etc. Et so first there is an academic, it's an academic field and uh, over the 20, 25 years that it exists, I think in practice, in, in other words, people are writing on the, mm -hmm. on the subject, we have many, many articles and books by now. Mm -hmm. it so it's academic first and foremost, yes. but then there is a market for those who want it in practice. And I mean by that, that there are a lot of physicians and healthcare providers, not necessarily Muslims, but Muslims and others, who in order to treat their patients need to be sensitive to the, um, to the points where Muslims might find difficulty with the regular so-called secular mm -hmm. medical ethics, S and they would look for... Does it relate to dietary needs or other things as well? Or? Almost in every field that um, biomedicine uh, treats, uh, contraceptives, abortions, 
uh, foods to be consumed or to keep away from. Mm -hmm. um, even plastic and the uh, surgeries and uh, the new re reproductive technologies. In each of these fields, there will be some point sensitive for Muslims mm -hmm. so that they can live with, it, with the technology or with the guidelines and yet not violate their religious doctrine. Mm -hmm. So basically it allows a better cultural adaptation and uh, sensitivity for the healthcare providers. If, for if the healthcare pr uh, providers, it's a, guide, it's a guidance. Mm -hmm. What uh, a Muslim patient, obviously one who abides by, by religion, by mm -hmm. his, rel his or her religion, what they can accept and live with, yes. and what is a no, 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 no way for them to take and to live with. So in this way, it is practical uh, this way, but also for the Muslim patient him, uh, himself or herself, if they are debating some treatment, they always want to know first and foremost whether it is okay according to their religious guidelines. Yeah. And that's where the Islamic uh, uh, medical ethics give them, gives them, provides them with the answers. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily black or white, yes. sometimes it provides a spectrum of ideas. Yeah. But the Muslim patient who wants, who wants to know whether he is within the limits of his or her uh, religion guidance or not, uh, he would tend to read or to find out what uh, Islamic bioethics has said on a topic. Yeah. Now, uh, maybe it sounds like a short introduction to Islamic bioethics and law, but I wanted to ask you, so you said that there are about uh, maybe 1.5 or 1.56, I think, billion Muslims around the world. I guess nobody counted, but that's a general estimation based on different surveys and so on. Um, in what language are these texts uh, written? How do people learn about Islamic bioethics? Uh, where is it? How is it advancing and so on? Because it seems like mm -hmm. a huge number of people probably not all speak yeah. one language. Right. So, um, indeed, not all Muslims speak the same language. In the Middle East, the, the Arabic is the predominant language, but that's only the language of about a quarter of a, of a billion uh, Muslims, while the majority have other languages. So the bioethics are usually announced in the language of the state, whether it is in Kuwait, it will be in Arabic, in Saudi, in Arabic, but Indonesians will have the bioethics in their language. Mm -hmm. The Turkish people will have it in their language, the Iranians in Farsi. Mm -hmm. But uh, here is the advantage of the scholarship, which tries to uh, unite and synthesize the, the ideas from here and there and try to see if there is a common uh, denominator. Mm -hmm. And most of the contemporary research is, uh, research is in English. Mm -hmm. So scholars that maybe uh, has, have knowledge of, of, I don't know, Pashto or Urdu in different languages, write in English and then we get some sort of glimpse into what is written in different parts of the world or what is done there? I'm sure they write in their language too. Yeah. But if they want it published, you know, the, the game, yeah. they would probably write it in a, mm. in a language that more people Yes. all over the world can share with them. Well, wh which brings me to my next question, and that is about the International uh, Congress or the International Conference within the Congress about Islamic uh, bioethics. So uh, who do you expect to maybe participate in it, to take part, uh, to present? Uh, what's going to happen? So uh, actually, we want a as many people as possible who are studying this field <coughs> in what, uh, w whatever topic they are interested in, uh, we call upon them to uh, send abstracts and uh, propose what they want to talk about. Mm -hmm. So we expect people from all over the world. We want people from Islamic states, from Arab states, from non-Arab and non-Islamic states. Uh, we have no uh, uh, specific uh, uh, Pre, uh, preconditions that they have to fulfill, uh, uh, except for that, that they are scholars of uh, Islamic medical ethics in, in one of its uh, discipline, in one of the disciplines that covers it. Yes. And here I mean uh, anybody in the field of sociology, religion, 
Islamic studies, law, medicine, of course, pharmacy in all its uh, uh, branches, um, uh, uh, psychology, uh, everything that has to deal with medical ethics in one way or another, and of course it touches upon the Islamic aspect of it, are uh, encouraged to, uh, to participate. Yes, and, and there's really an opportunity to mention that uh, the collaboration with the World Association for Medical Law is uh, basically intended to show the connection between uh, ethics and the law, in, in this case uh, religious ethics or religious law, mm -hmm. and contemporary law. Um, uh, you know, while writing my doctorate in, in law, I focused on, uh, I'd say, mental capacity in um, Islamic law and contemporary law as well and how is it connected and related to one another. And there are a lot of fields where we can see the connection between the fields, and that's something we are hoping probably to develop. Uh, so I would maybe extend uh, uh, the uh, call for people. Uh, people of the field of law are more than invited to, to look at the connection between uh, contemporary law and religious law, as the same as doctors are, are called to think about the relevance of religious law in their work and to maybe present something in this regard. Um, if I may add, sure. um, the, the advantage of such an interdisciplinary uh, conference as we hope uh, to hold, which is also a continuation of three previous uh, conferences of the same uh, nature or similar nature held in other parts uh, of, of the world, is that uh, you also have the uh, possibility for comparison. Mm -hmm. Uh, comparative uh, ethics between religions, between different types of societies, between uh, um, uh, so rich and poor societies, between uh, more traditional and more modern societies. All these aspects also have here a chance to be uh, to surface. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, what are you hoping to achieve in this conference? Is there any kind of plan or? kind of continuous uh, plan after the conference uh, that you're hoping to perhaps achieve? Well, this would be the fourth. We will definitely hope for at least the fifth, yes. not to be greedy about <laughs> others. Yes. Um, what we hope to achieve is uh, uh, even more than we achieved uh, previously, that the conference will be a convening place for people from all over the world that maybe beforehand didn't believe that they'd meet one another, a, a lawyer from here and a doctor from there and an Islamic scholar from here and a sociologist from, from another place, which all come together and focus on this uh, a topic of uh, Islamic medical ethics. From my experience, this meeting by itself and exchange of ideas is so inspiring so uh, so fascinating that once a conference of this nature ends, people are looking forward for the next one. So first, it's a place for exchange of ideas. More practically, of course, we would like uh, to come out with some tangible fruit, and we really hope, uh, like the previous conferences, to come up with a publication. Mm -hmm. uh, we hope uh, that the papers will be uh, real uh, uh, renovative and uh, innovative and uh, and uh, interesting and of course we will have them peer-reviewed and we hope to publish the best papers in a volume after the conference. Mm. Well, sounds <laughs> promising. So uh, Vadit, Professor Vadit Rispel Chaim of the Haifa University, I uh, thank you very much for this time. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure to work with you towards this international uh, conference uh, of uh, Islamic bioethics, and uh, we invite you all to submit your papers. Uh, you should probably do that in the next few months uh, before the end of April, I think, 2015. And we would love to have you in the International uh, Conference on Islamic Bioethics and the Annual Congress on Medical Law in Coimbra, Portugal. Thank you. <laughs>